hey, Mo wants to see you. So I would go see him. He goes, what the hell are you doing? Why are you swinging at that pitch? Are you blind? You're so stupid. Come on, let's go. We need to win <laughs> every time. So, Alex, an incredible coincidence with this year's Hall of Fame class. You played with three of them, of course, Edgar Martinez, Mariano Rivera, Mike Messina. They're all close friends. You played against Roy Halladay a whole bunch. So I want you to give me stories about each of these guys. Edgar Martinez, who you played with as a rookie with the Mariners. Tell me what it was like first getting to know him and stalking him around the batting cage. All of that is true, Buster. I mean, I, I, I was so lucky to have people like Edgar Martinez, Ken Griffey Jr., um, Lou Pinella. But Edgar Martinez is the one that stands out for me because he was a right-handed hitter with power that made perfect contact, won two batting titles, was an infielder uh, from Puerto Rico. There was so much for me to gravitate, and I just wanted to be like Edgar Martinez, both on and off the field. I stalked him. I would, I would literally, I would just literally study him like a cobra and just find out at what time he would go to the ballpark and get his ice and of course, it would get him a while to get going. He was older. He had knee issues. But every time he was in the batting cage, I was there waiting for him. I had my seat, front row seat, and I would just watch and study. And what was interesting to me, he always used a heavier bat in batting practice, and he put a lot of pine tar. And he always had a donut, and he would always carry the donut. I don't know why he was doing it. I started doing it the same thing. I just hope something rubbed off. <laughs> it didn't quite rub off as good as it worked for him. And then, of course, I took some of those habits and those lessons that I learned from Edgar, and I brought him to New York as a Yankee and shared them with the Robinson Canoes, the Derek Jeters, the Melky Cabreros, the Bernie Williams, and they all wanted to hear Edgar Martinez stories just like any fan would because he was the one guy that everyone respected from players to managers to front offices, revered by the fans, and at All-Star Games, I mean, people would literally rally around. You would see like players with a bunch of media around them with Edgar Martinez. You saw him with a bunch of players around him each one, me being one of them, peppering them with questions. So when you were in the on-deck circle, when you were with the Yankees, how many of those mannerisms, things you were doing, were drawn directly from Edgar? Buster, one of the things I wanted to do when I, uh, we went from the Kingdom across the street to Safeco Field is I begged the clubhouse manager to put me in the locker right next to him. And I had to petition because a lot of people wanted that real estate, but somehow I won. And what I learned was by watching by imitating, but by asking hundreds and hundreds of questions, not only in the locker room, but also uh, on plane rides across the country. Uh, being in Seattle, we had the luxury of very long flights, so I used that to my advantage. But one of the things he taught me was on the undeck circle, how to start really re rehearsing your at bat, getting in second vision, which means making sure you're seeing the ball better than ever before, timing it, using the leg kick, and really even from the way I put pine tar on my bat, all of that had Edgar Martinez stamp written all over it. You mentioned about the plane rides. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you would do during a long plane ride from <laughs> Seattle to New York. Well, we would have these like really long flights from Seattle to New York, a lot of them overnight. And, you know, Edgar liked uh, a little wine. And uh, I was 18, so I wasn't really drinking wine. I still don't drink too much wine. But... Uh, it was he would get really relaxed and it was great to get him off the field because you could get him with his hair down a little bit and uh i would start asking him questions and we're flying now like over portland and we get to like oklahoma and these are baseball questions these are all baseball questions and some off the field as well i mean he was just a great man overall that just happened to be a fantastic baseball player and somewhere around chicago he would go, okay, okay, that's enough. Go to the front of the plane. And, and there I was on my way. And the same flight, next flight, I would do it all over again. And I did that literally for about six and a half years. He paid you a great compliment when you were a young player. What do you remember about that when his compliment <laughs> for you shows up in the newspaper? You know, he, he said something really nice, which was like, Alex has unlimited potential. And if he keeps this up, he can, you know, something like the sky's the limit. And uh, he can hit 40 home runs one day and hit 300 and all this other stuff. I literally went home and cut it out. I took the scissors out, took the newspaper and cut it out and put it right in my mirror in my bathroom. Uh, and all my friends that would come over and say, come check this out in my room. And I would say, look what Edgar Martinez said. And of course, I was 19 and 20. And what I learned is that the power of words, when you're a leader, the power of words of how you can impact the next generation is huge. And Edgar Martinez impacted me in the biggest way. You played with Mariana Rivera with the Yankees. You told me about how competitive he is mm -hmm. And that would mm -hmm. manifest even in the clubhouse when he hadn't even gone out of the bullpen yet. 
There was no one you wanted to see less than two people. George Steinbrenner or Mariano Rivera, especially if things were going bad. And of course, Mariano Rivera, and especially in the old stadium, he would sit there by the bathroom getting worked on for the first five innings. And then, of course, about six or seventh inning, like 007, he would put on his jacket, he would stretch, he would put on that beautiful Yankee blue, and he would just walk in a peaceful walk to center field uh, to the old Yankee Stadium. He would get driven all the way around uh, by the hallways. But in the first five innings, if things were going bad, I mean, literally, he would be waiting for me. He'll tell the bad boy, as soon as A-Rock comes up here, tell him to come see me. So literally, hey, Mo wants to see you. So I would go see him. He goes, what the hell are you doing? Why are you swinging at that pitch? Are you blind? You're so stupid. Come on, let's go. We need to win <laughs> every time. And then, of course, if I hit a home run, I said, Hop, how do you like that, Papa? You like that? He goes, shut up. Go out there and do it again. <laughs> so <laughs> he you was had, awesome. You had some throwing issues uh -huh. early on with the Yankees. How did he help you with those? Well, he basically just told me, he goes, what are you doing? You're throwing the ball over the place. Like, I can't even leave my family tickets behind first base because you're going to kill someone. <laughs> and he brought some levity to it. But then we started long tossing every day. And this is how given he is. He would pitch, you know, three, four, five times in one week sometimes. If we had a great week and he had to close, he sat there and long tossed with me every day. And if you remember old Yankee Stadium, I sat in the first baseline. He sat right at the 399 all the way in left center field. And he was so far. And I'm a former quarterback, but I can't throw it as far as Mo. And I would literally take like five or six steps. It looked like an Olympic throwing the ball as far as I can. Javelin thrower. Yeah, like a javelin thrower. And he sat there like in one leg and just kind of laugh and just go. And I mean, the ball, it was like a beautiful arcing rainbow. It would never come back. I would catch it right here every time. And I would get so pissed. And he would just make fun of me. But then we would come up short and he would say, hit me 10 right at the NY. And we would go boom, 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 8 out of 10, 9 out of 10. And the point is, he gave out of himself as he usually does to make one of his teammates better. And of course, Mo is one that I love him as a friend, as a brother, and uh, someone who's been there for me always. He was a remarkable athlete when he was a pitcher. Mm -hmm. And you guys would get tested every spring, whether it was uh, leaping ability, <laughs> whether eyesight. What jumped out to you? Well, a lot of things. I mean, we, we usually invite with the Yankees about 75 players or so, plus or minus, to spring training. Now, at the time, he was 41. And we get, you know, eye test. We get every test you can think about. And one of them is vertical jump. Uh, Mariano Rivera, at the age of 41, had the best vertical jump of all 75 players. He could not wait to tell me that. And uh, he is just phenomenal. Look, he's, uh, his first sport, I always say, is uh, soccer and a fisherman. His father was a fisherman. And what's, what's great about uh, you know, Mariano Rivera, Joe Torre always said, look, we have a gold glove center fielder in Bernie, Bernie Williams. The best center fielder on this team is Mariano Rivera. When you were going through your problems, he flew down to Miami to basically get in your face. And tell me that story. He let us, when I was going through my very difficult times uh, in Miami, uh, he let, you know, my family stay with him at his home. Uh, he then flew to Miami and spent time with me. And, you know, Mariano, the one thing is he's an ultimate closer where things are going good or they're going bad. Uh, he never sugarcoated anything. Just because he was there, that does not mean he accepted any of the crap that I did. He was the toughest, but he did it in a loving way and a compassionate way. He never gave up on me. And for all the games Mariano has saved, uh, those trips to Miami and him letting us stay at his home is what uh, I'll, be rem I'll remember Ma as. When you came back to the Yankees uh, and you were owning uh, mistakes that you felt like you had made, you said that Rivera gave you a great compliment. Yeah, you know, Mo didn't give a lot of compliments, you know, uh, but we had a quiet moment in uh, 2015, and I was on my way to hit 33 home runs and getting, helping the Yankees get back to the postseason. And he sat down with me, and, uh, you know, Mo reminds me of George Steinbrenner a lot because he is, he is the best, but he's tough, and he does it in a loving way. He sat to me just, just like George Steinbrenner would, would tell me, and he said, hey, young man, uh, I'm proud of you, and uh, keep going. How much did that mean to you? I mean, I'm telling you now, and it just gives me, you know, goosebumps because uh, he's someone that I respect so much. And it's funny, he's going in as a 100% Hall of Famer. And I, I think that has to do less with his performance on the mound and more with who this man is and what, how he made people around him feel. He played with Mike Messina, mm -hmm. who's a very private person. You know, a lot of players don't always uh, link, uh, you know, make connection with him. But he did early on coming over to your position, trying to help you when you were struggling at the plate. 
It was strange. We were like the odd married couple. I mean, you never think a young kid from Miami who's Dominican would be really good friends with a guy from Montoursville, Pennsylvania, who then went to Stanford and got his college degree in three years. We had some of the most amazing dinners, uh, talked about everything from, you know, pitching styles, routines, uh, investments, uh, family dynamics. And Mike Mussina, he's just one of these guys that he's just one of the most professional, accountable, uh, resilient competitors I've ever met. How did he help you with your hitting uh, one day, I know, during <laughs> batting practice? You know, Mike, I couldn't hit to save my life. I mean, he was in his prime. I wasn't in my prime. And he absolutely made me look like a high school player. Uh, he had five pitches, like an incredible poker player. You just never knew what was going to be his next play or pitch. And every time I would guess a pitch or location, I was always wrong. I mean, it was remarkable. I would always try to most guess myself. I said, I think I'm gonna, a fastball's coming, and I would look for a curveball, trying to trick my own brain. And even there, I was wrong. So I just, no, nothing worked. One day, I was struggling in my early days with the Yankees, and he, he usually would shag fly balls out in center field. And I see Mike making a walk all the way to third base. Now, of course, uh, Boa's hitting me ground balls, and I'm firing over third base, and I was always very focused when I caught ground balls, but I couldn't help but see Mike Mussina behind me. And I'm like, you know, you do one of these, you catch ground balls. Now the third or fourth, now you're going like, you want me? And he goes, yeah, I need you. I go, okay, five more, boy. So he hits me five more. And now I'm like, I'm racing. Like, what does Mike want to talk to me during batting practice? So he goes over, he goes, hey, how do you feel at the plate? I said, I feel like crap, <laughs> exactly how it looks. And he goes, look, I faced you so many times and that swing you have right now is not the guy that I faced. I said, okay, tell me more. He goes, you have all this energy. Once you get your swing, you have all this energy like this, and all of that is just eyewash. Like, it doesn't matter. Think about, like, Roger Federer. Like, once you hear you're so strong, now all you have to do is just flick the ball and actually stop right there. I go, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like, all you need to do is do that and hit the ball 400 feet. I said, okay, e easier said than done. I mean, sure. So I went to the batting cage, and I literally started doing, like, some half swings. And that night, I go out and throw out three hits. The next night, I hit two home runs. The next night, I hit a home run, and I'm off to the races. And then he asked for 5% of my next contract. So, <laughs> <laughs> Roy Halladay, what was it like to face him? I mean, hard. You know, I thought we knew him far too well. Uh, our our, our hitters absolutely hated facing him I was one of the guys that actually did okay and I was like somewhere on the Mendoza line around 200 uh, maybe a little bit better than that but he, he was a guy that nine innings was par for him uh, like all the great athletes Muhammad Ali you know Michael Jordan Tiger Woods at the apex of their careers uh, there was no question that the best pitch in the world was Roy Holiday and he was a professional. He went about it the right way. He was a workhorse. And for young pitchers around him, the stories are legendary. Much like Roger Clemens, people would just follow him. And he was revered by players, pitchers in other leagues. The one unfortunate thing about this whole Hall of Fame is the guy that made him from good to great was Mariano Rivera by teaching him the cutter at an all-star game, ironically. And we're saying like, Mo, you want to win? You call yourself a champion? We can't get a hit off this guy because now he throws a cutter and he's carving up all our lefties and me and righties. He goes, ah, oh, he's a quick learner. I go, well, thanks. Now they're going to the Hall of Fame together and, of course, the late Doc Holliday. So Roy Holiday at an All-Star game, did you ever take the chance to go and talk to him and get to know him a little bit? Yeah, I tried to recruit Roy Holiday to come to the Yankees. And really? Go, when? Yeah, so it was one of the All-Star games, and we're walking the red carpet, and there was talks that Brian Cash was trying to expand our roster and really get a frontline starter to get us over the top. And uh, I remember walking the red carpet, he was with his wife, and I said, hey, Roy, you know, I, of course, I knew he was a very low-key guy, family guy. I said, you know, we have very quiet places in New York. We have Connecticut, we have Westchester, we have Purchase, you know, Andy Pettit and Mike Pettit. <laughs> I mean, we have Andy Pettit, and we have uh, Mike, Mike Messina and, and Mariano. They're all family guys, and they all live out there. You don't have to be, like, crazy like us and live in the city. And he goes, oh, really? Yeah, yeah, I've, I've heard about that. I said, yeah, I mean, Brian Cash was just a great guy. We have a great clubhouse. I was doing my best pitch, and I knew it was an elevator pitch because I knew that we had, like, about, you know, 90 seconds. So I was giving my best uh, New York Yankee pitch to bring in Ryan Holiday. And the good news is he was open to it, um, especially when he knew that there was a quieter side to New York City.
Thank you for watching ESPN on YouTube. For more sports highlights and analysis, be sure to download the ESPN app. And for live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+.